Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Harassus USA panel discussion. I'm glad you're able to join us for what promises to be an interesting conversation on some key climate questions. Our topic for today is big pledges potentially outperform government climate initiatives. Private entities, including several wealthy individuals and collectives, have pledged $2 trillion annually to achieve net zero annual emissions by 2040. This is 10 years before the targets set by the governmental negotiation process at COP. So to start the discussion, our panelists will be exploring three key questions. We'll then open up the discussion for follow-on points from panelists, as well as Q&A from the audience. So if you would like to ask a question, please indicate that using the platform functions. Um, there's, there's a chat function where you can uh, type your question in, and I'll call on you and make your microphone live at the appropriate time. So before we start, allow me to briefly introduce myself. My name is Rick Wayman. I'm the CEO of the Foundation for Climate Restoration, an NGO that educates and advocates for a restored climate where carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere return to pre-industrial levels around 300 parts per million by the year 2050. Before joining the climate movement last year, I spent many years working in the US and internationally for the elimination of nuclear weapons. I shared in the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize for our campaign's work at the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons to achieve the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons at the United Nations that year. It's an honor to be here today and to moderate this panel with my distinguished colleagues. So the first question that we're gonna to explore today is will business achieve more than governments? So first I'm gonna turn it over to Natalie Samovich. Natalie is co-founder and CIO of mcpv.eu and Resilient Hydrogen with a focus on solar cells and modules manufacturing and green hydrogen products development. Natalie contributes to EU research and innovation policy as chair of the working group on smart energy at the Alliance of IoT Innovation. She chairs the ETIP SNET platform working group one on EU smart grids. She's based between Lisbon, Brussels, and Amsterdam. Natalie, over to you. Will business achieve more than governments? Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, great to be here at Harasis uh, during these very difficult times uh, globally, I think, and very challenging times uh, globally. Uh, thanks uh, for the question, Rick. Um, so going directly into the uh, answer, because it's a, it's a very complex uh, topic and has many sides to it. Um, but my position on this is, Business is uh, uh, closely linked to the uh, policy, business closely linked to the innovation, and business closely linked to the uh, acceptance also. So I would say that uh, we cannot distinguish uh, fully uh, and have this rally who's going to be the first, who's going to do more. In my opinion, it takes four sides um, to, to bring this challenge uh, towards the execution. Um, in the EU, um, the first emphasis was on technology development, then on the uh, scaling it up uh, um, and the policy. Um, then, then materialized, uh, um, and we have uh, you know very very strong commitments uh, in Europe. Uh, but we quickly realized that without having uh, the consumers, uh, the, the customers, the uh, citizens on board for this journey uh, would not get us far. So that's why I think it is really, um, it's not even a triangle, but it's a, it's a, um, it's a four-sided uh, uh, equation uh, to have all four on board. Great. Thanks, Natalie. I uh, appreciate your thoughts on that. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Dwight Hopkins to respond. 
Dwight N. Hopkins is co-founder and co-managing director of Prometheus Nova Ventures, a venture capital firm focused on education technology. He's based in Chicago. Dwight, over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction and glad to be here. As Natalie indicated, it's a very important time domestically and internationally. Um, I think the question of private sector, government sector depends on the country and the traditions in the country. Uh, for example, there are some governments around the world that are much more centralized. And so if they're able to set a particular goal, for example, you know, reducing grass, greenhouse gas emissions, the entire country can move very quickly and very rapidly. And then you have other governments in other countries around the world, which are much more decentralized. And therefore, the private sector doesn't have to go through a lot of bureaucratic debate and discussion. They can take a position, take a decision and move more rapidly. So again, it depends. I think it's a question, the question is so general that it has to be brought down to country to country. However, I think there's a third model. On the one hand, we mentioned tightly centralized governments and on the other governments which are very decentralized and are caught into sort of check and balances bureaucracies at the top. But there seems to me there's a third possibility where there's uh, public private partnerships, the PPPs. And to me, those are the best examples in the best countries around the world where we can tackle the issues of change in climates, change in temperatures, and also reach the goal of 1.2 uh, in terms of temperatures with, uh, within, uh, with globally. Um, also want to add though, so even if we have public-private partnerships around this issue of climate, we have to bring into consideration several other factors. We have to bring into consideration the larger civic, the larger public, and of course, those are the, the important roles of in, the important roles of NGOs in this in this matter. Uh, even citizens protests, people protesting around the issue, um, lobbying, um, social media campaigns, uh, youth and students. So there's the public private partnership, particularly businesses and governments. But there's this other third sector, which is the broader public, and those have to be manifested as well as mobilized country by country. Great points. Uh, thank you, Dwight. Can you all see me? My, uh, my video seems to have gone away on my screen. We can yeah. hear you, but we can't we see can you. We can hear you, but we cannot uh, see you. And I had to change a place as well because my, <laughs> my laptop is running out of battery, so I ah, have to okay. reposition myself. But no, we, we can, can hear, hear you. you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, well, I, I assure you I'm still here. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that's great. Thank you both for, uh, for your answers on that. And um, Dwight, I actually want to stay with you uh, on this second question. Uh, so uh, let's see. Our second question is, will pledges by the private sector let governments take less action forgetting their duty to humanity. Um, Dwight, what do you think? I think there are definitely a, a tendency and a wary that if the private sector ramps up, in this case, two trillion USD to deal with climate, then governments can say, well, they have several options, right? They can say, well, we'll match you with two trillion, which makes it four trillion. That's one option. Or they might say, well, you know, private sector can take the lead, they can be the anchor in this, and then we'll just help out here and there. So I do think there's a tendency for for uh, for for governments to sort of give the responsibility more completely, if not wholly, to the private sector. Um, but I also want to mention um, this figure of $2 trillion, which we have. You know, the, the International Energy Agency, IEA, is uh, well, they just put out a report. They put out a report in the last year on net zero by 2050, and as we know, the International Energy Association is made up of um, I think it's 31 member countries, eight association countries. By the way, Russia is not part of this, and uh, it was founded in 1974. And the mission of this international energy agency is to work with the governments and industry, both public and private sectors to produce sustainable energy for the entire world. And in their report, 
uh, next net zero by 2050, they said that, in fact, all the countries that have made a pledge to 2050 right now have not fulfilled their obligations. They've signed on, but they haven't fulfilled their obligations with specific short-term, long-term measures. And what the report of the International Energy Agency suggests, in order to get to 2050, uh, two things, at least two things have to happen. We have to have clean energy between now and 2030, 20 years ahead of 2050. And the second thing to emphasize is there has to be at least six trillion USD per year in clean energy. So that opens up, that's, you know, that's 3x the current two trillion we're discussing here. Um, so the situation is very, very serious, if not in a crisis perspective, as far as investment in, in clean energy and clean technology. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Dwight. <clears throat> uh, Natalie, let's go over to you. Um, what do you think? Will, will pledges by the private sector let governments take less action? Um, yes. Uh, great. Um finishing and starting point from Dwight on, 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 on this. Um, governments, uh, so I'm speaking on the um, from the perspective of uh, EU uh, and the commitments that were made towards the cli climate neutrality um, of 2050, uh, but we already see that the 2030 goals are continuously uh, being pushed uh, to the new uh, new limit, basically. Uh, and the moment that uh, the forty percent was uh, was agreed by the EU, um, the call is to uh, push that forward and forward, meaning achieve the climate neutrality earlier and earlier. Uh, what I'm observing in in the European Union, uh, in spite of the fact that the overall approach, the individual member states climate plans um, are uh, more ambitious than the goals for the 2030. Uh, that's point one. Um, and then if you go deeper on the level of business, um, everyone is viewing the achieving the climate goals not only as an obligation not only as but also as a green business um, opportunity there is strategic repositioning of the portfolio uh, we had uh, um, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with something um, called the uh, green taxonomy that's been uh, approved which is supposed to uh, push both push the businesses as well as to facilitate the business um, on uh, um, shifting the investments towards the green assets. Um, uh, this is, uh, so as you can see, it, it is not exactly pub public-private partnership, but it is this interplay between the policy, um, the business commitments, and as well as the incentives, which is something that I didn't uh, uh, mention before. Um, and the incentives, uh, not necessary on the uh, uh, subsidies side, not necessary on the uh, um, uh, on, on the uh, uh, taxation side, but the incentives related to the uh, green taxonomy and uh, the in, enshrined uh, goals there. Um, the, the, the climate uh, uh, plans, individual member states, the climate plans um, are really yeah, yeah. ambitious and some countries already uh, exceed the originally pledged ones. So um, that, that, that would be Great. Thanks, Natalie. And um, Natalie, we'll actually stick with you here on this last question, uh, which is, who do you trust more, business or government leadership? Yes, um, that's the, the most difficult part in terms of the trust. Um, um, I think I will side with uh, uh, Dwight on this because it cannot be um, looked at, you know, globally with the um, same lens, let's put it that way. So I'm more comfortable to talk about the, uh, um, the, the European Union and, uh, and what's uh, taking place here. In this case, trust is not like the uh, data share trust. Uh, in, in this case, it's, it's, it's the commitment as execution trust. Um, that's how I read it. And the commitment, I think, um, um, is so much aligned that this, the, the 
it is not a question of trust. It's the question of um, are we going to get enough investment commitment? And I think the, the green taxonomy will, um, will help. So this is one angle. And it's also the question of uh, can we execute fast enough? Um, and uh, the third angle of it, uh, um, will governments and uh, the European Union push the targets even uh, further um, if, if there is, you know, bottom-up push for it? And, uh, and uh, also, as was mentioned before, from the civil society. Um, so I think the trust is there, but I will maintain my first approach that it, 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 it's really a four-sided uh, um, effort. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Natalie. And uh, just j as a reminder here before I turn it over to Dwight, um, for, for those who have just joined us, my video seems to have gone out. And as the host of this session, I don't want to leave and try to come back uh, for fear that that would end the whole session. So uh, you're looking at a black screen, uh, but, but I'm here and, uh, and happy that you all are, are with us. So Dwight, over to you. Who do you trust more, business or government? Well, I'd like to follow up. I think that the word trust sort of puts a sort of a fuzzy type of perspective on it. Also, it may raise the questions of intentions of the parties. I, I would prefer likewise to talk about who can be efficient and effective in real results. Um, and again, for me, it has to be a combination, the public-private partnership which would include industry, include government. And also, as I mentioned earlier, there are other partners who can bring results. And those are you know, from various forms of media, social media, legacy media, uh, youth, uh, citizens' protests, those types of issues. Um, and also, I think that we have to look, at least from the U.S. perspective, uh, we can't do it alone. We've got to be in partnership with other allies uh, who are walking the same path. So I would say uh, not so much the issue of trust, but how do we pull together a, a strategy and then tactics and who can come along to carry out the, the mission? Um, let me just say a word about the United States. I mean, I, 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 I mean in addition to being uh, having a, a venture capital ed, educational technology firm, I uh, also am the founding director of the uh, Environmental, Social and Governance Research Center at the University of Chicago. So we we teach this, we do consulting, and we also do ratings for different companies around ESG. Of course, E is environment. Um, so oftentimes when I'm talking to folks, they really don't know the details. We just assume. So I just wanted to maybe insulting or may not, but I think it's important to, to, to grasp, at least for U.S. audiences, what we're talking about. We're talking about greenhouse gases and how they're emitted. And these greenhouse gases they block the, they don't escape. They sort of cover the atmosphere. And when they cover the atmosphere, it traps the heat. And that heat is melting, you know, snow and ice and causing all of this. So greenhouse gases uh, go up into the atmosphere. They, they don't escape. And so the heat stays down on earth. That's the, the rising te earth temperatures. The other thing too, is that a lot of these greenhouse gases are uh, come from various sources, but at least in the, in the U.S., about 70 to 80 percent of the greenhouse gases come from carbon dioxide, CO2. And those that CO2 comes from natural gas, oil and coal. And that's what everybody's talking about, coal and natural gas and oil, at least in the U.S. context, because they emit 70 to 80 percent of the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is one of the major, in our context, developers or uh, 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 categories for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so the other thing too, in the U S there, are uh, probably the, the carbon dioxide is, is broken down roughly in these categories, about 29% comes from transportation. So we have to have a point there, how we deal with transportation, uh, about 25% come from electricity, 23% from industry, 13% from residential and commercial and 10% from agriculture. So I would trust and sort of inverted commas those stakeholders who are able to target the reduction of those percentages. And again, as we mentioned earlier, each country, each region could be very radically different, but there has to be uh, the data as well as the will, as well as the multiple stakeholders involved. 
And of course, it is true, as we've been talking about, there has to be cent- a central role for both private sector as well as a government. In the U.S. context, I mean, unfortunately, in our history right now, this is one of the most fractious, contentious part on the federal level of governments. And so private sector has to step in. And we see this, right? The Gates Foundations and others, Rockefeller Foundations, um, different people from Wall Street, Silicon Valley, and even some university pensions where I am are stepping up. So again, if we come right back down to the country, I think at this point in the U.S., the private sector is probably in a better situation to be more efficient. In that sense, we can trust. All right. Great. Uh, thank you both. Uh, and that I feel like uh, this conversation is, is kind of going in a really interesting direction. And um, I think at this point, we can, we can maybe just expand on that a little bit. Um, uh, I'm not seeing any questions at the moment from the audience. So um, I guess uh, I'll, I'll open it back up to, to both of you in a second. Uh, but Dwight, something you said near the end there just got me thinking of uh, something that my NGO is working on quite a bit right now, which is uh, essentially trying to, to create more of a, a public-private partnership in a way between uh, companies that are innovating in the space of low carbon and carbon negative building materials, uh, concrete being a, a major one. Um, so uh, between companies that are that are doing that, innovating in that space, and governments, which are the largest purchaser of materials like that, concrete especially. So uh, we're we're working with both sides, uh, trying to bring them together, trying to get governments to to recognize the climate impacts that their purchasing decisions have, and the power that governments have to make a difference. And uh, if, if they prioritize low carbon, carbon negative building materials, they can make uh, a substantial difference in CO2 emissions. And eventually from our perspective, um, once these technologies are up to scale and, and operating fully uh, and, and operating as carbon negative, uh, we can actually bring levels of uh, legacy emissions down in the atmosphere as well. So it's very exciting and it is going to take um, public and private working together uh, to make it happen. Uh, neither neither side at, at this point uh, in the United States, for sure, is is powerful enough um, or influential enough to make it happen on their own. Um, so looks like we've got about twenty minutes left. Um, Natalie, as as someone in, working in the private sector and um, cooperatively with with others, um, just just want to find out from you uh, what what you what you've been experiencing on the EU level, what the, um, what the, the level of uh, cooperation and openness with governments is, uh, are they making your, your life as it were, um, your company's life easier uh, or, or are you finding a lot of governmental roadblocks to the environmental goals that you're trying to achieve? Um, fortunately, um a really positive progress within the past, uh, I would say, three years. And when we're talking about the governments, you know, we have uh, 27. So, um, and since the solutions that that um, we are putting together should be of relevance not only to one country but um, EU wide and and globally, um, then this this support is very important. And I would like to bring back the. Uh, um, um, the topic that I mentioned in the first question is the um, is the European initiatives on the projects um, of uh, strategic importance, um, and uh, they are influenced because they are really truly uh, uh, private initiatives. Uh, I hear a little bit of the uh, back. Um, yes, now it's better. Thank you. Um, so and uh, the commitment. Uh, 
towards these projects of the uh, strategic importance uh, come from uh, bottom up, from the uh, from the industry, from the technology providers, uh, and then the industry and technology providers go to the EU and ask for the support, and the EU asks um, member states, you know, the ones who want to support the initiative, and we had uh, um, already more than five of this um, um, collective efforts um, focused on the uh, current priorities. One was on the battery EPI, so uh, is to really gear up the efforts across the EU, across 27 member states, uh, towards the uh, the production, innovation, um, integration of the batteries. Um, so that was one EPI. Same on the microelectronics. Uh, um, similar and even greater and more coordinated effort on the on hydrogen uh, EPSI. Um, so um, and now now we are working on the uh, on the solar EPSI. And in this case, um, a number of governments uh, become core supporters and the industry is core supporters of the initiatives, and then it becomes the EU wide um, initiative. Um, so uh, that's that's a long answer to your question. I think it it, it takes this uh, uh, two sides on the public private, but in a different, uh, slightly different format that uh, um, Dwight described. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, and I would like to welcome Marie, uh, who is our third panelist. And um, hopefully, Marie, you're here and you can hear us. Uh, if you are, I would invite you to unmute and uh, just quickly introduce yourself and uh, we'll get you integrated into the conversation here. So, Marie, if you can hear us, uh, go ahead and unmute. Ah, she has uh, just in the chat, she says her connection is unstable. So let's uh, let's see. Marie, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? OK. Uh, yes, we can. Welcome. Can you hear me? It's in and out, Marie. Uh, we, we can hear you. I really want to be part of this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, why don't you go ahead? Uh, uh, I could just hear you then. Um, can you go yes, ahead and, uh, and just quickly introduce yourself? Yes, yes. My name is Marie DeZanis, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Northern Trust Global Investments and the Executive Vice President and Head of the Asset Management Business for Northern Trust Asset Management, which is a $1.2 trillion asset manager. And um, by way of introduction on this, um, this is something near and dear to our heart, because not only as a firm are we a um, original uh, signatory and initial member of Climate Action 100, but personally signed the One Planet Sovereign Wealth and Asset Management Agreement with President Macron. We follow and subscribe to the UN principles of uh, BRI and um, also are endorsers of uh, uh, SASB as well as TCFD. And so as a firm, we're engaged in steward uh, stewardship across the industry uh, with institutional and large global family offices on how to accomplish this. And one of the things that um, I, I would like to offer as perspective is the challenge of, you know, this um, the circle of how to effectively get things done quickly and take action because I'm involved in industry dialogues around how do we get more adaptation to successfully move the needle with uh, private wealth and also with uh, institutions and governments. So oh, just coming back from uh, Saudi Arabia yesterday, today, this morning, just now, um, you know, it, it's interesting to have perspective on how vastly different these governments and countries are engaging with the willingness to move from what I'll say uh, brown economies to more green initiatives. And if I reflect on um, Netherlands that aligns with their institutional uh, accounts and a lot of their governments and pensions are aligned to Paris Align benchmarks, getting their carbon net zero to be targeted by 2050. Sweden is looking to move by 2040. Um, I, I do see aggressive climate um, initiatives taking place now in the Middle East as well. The, the challenge is, is that can individual efforts supplant and, and pass by 
um, and accelerate faster the initiatives than the governments. And, you know, what I, I'd offer is that the government has to work in tandem with these, um, with the willingness to go green with a, or go carbon net free, um, a hand in glove with the large, with the largest institutions and with the largest investors. Because without that, without that hand in glove working together, what happens is, is you inadvertently have global inconsistencies in regulations, which makes it very challenging to implement. It means that you could have differing taxonomies and differing taxonomies. You'll look at, you know, I, I'd call uh, SFDR initiatives um, in EU are far advanced versus maybe some other markets, but forces other markets to fall in line or have differing definitions, which is a lot of expense, time and energy. So um, my my takeaway is, is that the activism, if you will, around the individual monies has got to force us all as investment management community, and I speak for myself and other uh, financial services industry, to have the right dialogue so we can accelerate quickly and take action. But it, it cannot be done independently. The wealth cannot do it by itself, and government can't do it without informed wealth. And thank you for the opportunity for speaking on stage here. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Marie. Uh, really great to have you. And um, and thank you for, for offering those perspectives. Um, Dwight, Natalie, do you have any any reflections on, on what Marie just said that, that you'd like to share? Um, yes. Oh, now we can see you, Marie. Great. Uh, <laughs> we could hear your voice. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, definitely. I'm not sure at what stage you joined us and if you could hear uh, i did mention the uh, the uh, the uh, the taxonomy the green taxonomy of the eu effort uh, um that 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 is being put in place which is a big catalyst right so there's there was still lots of debate you know what's in and what's out but it's definitely a, a very important state uh, stage um and from that moment on let's say it is green what um it's it's more of a question to you what do you think is uh uh, is, is is this this catalyst is the uh, the game changer to accelerate things? Are we still um, and 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 who would be uh, moving things faster? Because you know, of course, we know that the um, the legacy um, uh, business is still on the books, right? Um, and 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 there are newcomers, and uh, uh, but they also don't have strong balance sheets. Uh, yet. So what is this, this right balance between uh, uh, these two scenarios? So if I can give you an example, a live example of something that I, I've um, uh, dealt with and observed. The Netherlands and Nordics have been for a time to more than exclusionary tactics. Can you hear me still? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe if, if you try keeping if you try keeping your video off, we we might get a, a better audio connection for you. Um, for uh, great. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, a live example is um, I can think yes. of, of a bank in the Netherlands that has the desire to push green initiatives and they have some investments that are so forced that we can't even benchmark it. So, you know, the intent of building a portfolio that's so holistically green, pensions and uh, asset owners are having a difficult time working through that. And for a question from an investment management standpoint, of if this benchmark is so variant from what I'm used to, do I really have full a grasp as a fiduciary that I'm outperforming? And that is one of the challenges industry um, has to better understand because we believe that you can absolutely have sustainable portfolios without compromised returns. But as a fiduciary, when you're something that's vastly different than what perhaps you've done before. A lot of diligence and a lot of checks and balances that infrastructure may not be in place. 
beliefs, it actually takes time, right? And then it comes back to the original framing of um, we have the right intent, we have, you know, right. But I just want to get and thank you for the question. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. Um, Dwight, I want to bring you in here. Um, any any thoughts you you want to share on on what you've heard from uh, Marie and, and Natalie just now? Yeah, um, I thank you, uh, Marie, so much for, for your perspective, the global perspective, and uh, what you bring to the table. Um, just a couple of thoughts. I think that um, when we talk about the comparing countries internationally, we also have to appreciate that. I think the more developed economies would have to uh, reach uh, climate neutrality much faster than some of the developing countries. And there are various reasons. I mean, the practicality of it, the question of underdeveloped countries having a time to develop economically, which may they need some leeway. So part of it is how we frame the question internationally and looking at different regions. Developed countries, I think, obviously, USA being a major uh, part of the developed world. And we gave some, you know, percentages of how much uh, global uh, greenhouse gases were being emitted from the United States early on. So that's the that's one part of the framework. Is it, to me, it's not just a blanket. We have to look at various regions, and we have to be attentive to developing countries um, along the way. Now, that also to me brings up the question of what is the relationship between um, lowering greenhouse gas emissions, CO two in particular, and then providing jobs. Because uh, it seems to me that if we're talking about uh, the environmental part, we also have to be attentive to the social part and the governance. And I mentioned earlier that I'm a founding director of the Environmental, Social and Governance Research Initiative at the University of Chicago. And for us, it has to be a, a comprehensive and integrated move. Obviously, there are going to be some great green jobs that have come along with uh, in developing the environment initiative. At the same time, even within the U.S., we've got to figure out how to promote those jobs, those would be the benchmark and the goals. But at the same time, how do we transition different people and, you know, different people in the rural areas or even some urban areas to this green job? So it has to be a balance between um, benchmark, goals, visions, markers, and the new uh, exciting plans and discoveries and even implementations of green jobs and green technologies on the one hand. At the same time, there might be some, some laggards here within the U.S., that uh, we have to be attentive to. All right, thanks, Dwight. Uh, Natalie, Marie, any um, any thoughts there? Um, Natalie, just wondering, maybe you could give us. Um, we heard a little bit from Dwight on the um, the U.S. side of that. Um, what, what's happening in the EU that that you might be able to share? Um. Yes, thanks. Um, uh, thanks, Rick. Um, on the upskilling and reskilling programs, you made a huge emphasis uh, um, to basically uh, to make sure that this uh, green and digital twin transition that the Europe is uh, um, undergoing right now as a response to the uh, um, COVID pandemic, because during the uh, uh, the past two years. Um, um, We've implemented uh, a, a program on the uh, transition, climate transition program, where each state um, had to put forward the plan, which included uh, both sides, so the green and the digital. Within these programs, also the um, the topics related to the job creation and specifically upskilling and reskilling um, were integral part of uh, of the program um so that's that's one angle how to tackle it um now each uh, if we go on the member state level um each coal plant or thermal plant that that is uh, closing um along it uh, there is there is a, a retraining program and the social support program so these are the uh, um climate transition funds um, that are allocated to it and the related programs. So it is a very coordinated um, effort and each member state had to sign um, for these transition plans and commit to it uh, as well as to get uh, support for. So, um, you, you know, if you look at the um, carbon intensity of Europe, it varies, you know, from north to south, east to west. 
um, and the areas that needed uh, most support during the not only the member states but also the regions because then we go on the regional level which is uh, even more relevant than than just uh, uh, a country um, so I would say that's that's the way to go in a very coordinated way bringing the um, uh, not only the uh, um, the side of the need for the uh, climate transition and, and the projects, but also an opportunity for the uh, for the green jobs and uh, reskilling and upskilling. Thanks, Natalie. Um, so just looking at the time here, uh, we've got just a few minutes left, and I want to make sure that each of you have a, a minute to share any final thoughts. So if, if I could go first to Marie and uh, see if, if there are any final thoughts that, that you have to share. Uh, see if, if there are any final thoughts that, that you have to share. Sure. Um, one of the things, and it, it certainly relates to um, what Dwight commented, is that we have the largest transfer of wealth taking place for, to the younger generation by the year 2035. And these younger people who are coming in with fiscal responsibility to change the world and great ambition were absolutely committed to invest with their values. And it presents wonderful career opportunities for stewardship, for engagement, for being able to promote diversity into the investing landscape. And I'm very encouraged in the direction that we're going. Is it fast enough for us all? Probably, I think we would all agree that no, we need to do more, faster, quicker, better. Um, but uh, I am encouraged in the direction. And I do think that younger generation will accelerate us. Obviously, how we migrated to technology. All right. Uh, thank you, Marie. Uh, we just we lost you right there at the end, um, but but caught most of it. So thank you so much. Um, Dwight, over to you. Any uh, any final thoughts to share? I want to follow up what Marie said. Yes, it's very important to uh, to appreciate that in every situation of crisis, either domestically or globally, there's always a slither of hope. And this time, I think we have a tsunami of hope. Um, some of the research interviews I do, as well as classes, and consulting I do I was with you know, the millennials and Gen Z. And uh, we have some students who, who are getting from, say, business schools who are in the generation uh, millennial and Gen Z. And, you know, they may get an offer for summer internship at Goldman Sachs and these other prestigious and more and more. I don't know what they're going to do long term, but they're saying, no, we want to go to do internships with companies that are, are environmental, social and government ESG driven. That's a great uh, in, uh, uh, indication. And as Marie said, I think that it's just an amazing transfer of wealth, something like 26 trillion. I mean, I can give you the number that the, the, that the uh, millennials and Gen Z, and they're all saying, I mean, we, we have stacks of research here at the university and, and um, interviews we've done that they all say, the majority of them say, we want to work at places that uh, are environmentally driven, ESG driven. So yeah, there's a great push from New ownerships of wealth, those are the investors. Also, there have been um, interviews with potential employers and, and I mean, employees. They sue us. So we're getting from all sides, consumers, workers, wealth-driven uh, sectors of the economy. And it's a big, 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 big uh, imp, uh, indication of hope for the future. Thanks, Dwight. And uh, Natalie, uh, any, any final thoughts to share here in our last minute? Yes, Yes, very quickly. Um, so the investment side, I think um, now, other than having the um, obligations to for the returns, also has the moral obligations and the ethical obligations um, added to um, uh, to that. And uh, hopefully, it's just going to accelerate things. And uh, collectively, I think we all will have to make it happen. Thank you. Um, so just a, a final note for me to share, um, Dwight and, and Marie, what, what you were sharing around hope. Um, realistic hope is, uh, is a big thing that, that I like to focus on with the climate challenge. And uh, I had a letter to the editor in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago in response to an article about climate anxiety that people of all ages are experiencing right now. 
And what I focused on is this idea of realistic hope. Uh, we as humans got ourselves into this climate mess. We can definitely get ourselves out of it. It's going to be a huge challenge, perhaps the biggest challenge that uh, that our, our our civilization has ever faced. But I believe we can do it, and and that's not that's not based on um, some pie in the sky idea. Uh, it, it's what we heard today. Uh, there's there are a lot of good things happening out there, and I'm grateful to the three of you for uh, for all the work and attention that you're giving to the climate issue, and um, and as well as all of our attendees today. Thank you all for your interest and for everything you're doing to make our world a better place. Uh, so again, thank you very much, Natalie Marie Dwight, for your contributions today. Uh, wonderful to know you all. I look forward to staying in touch. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll, I'll get to meet you in person at a uh, Harassus event in the near future. Thank you for hosting, Rick. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for moderating, Rick. Thank okay. You. Best wishes to you all. And, and with that, we'll sign off. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.